Dear participants, fellow philanthropists, good morning. And thank you, Ingrid, for your kind invitation here. And thank you, Ingrid, for being very short in my introduction. I hate people who speak a long time about you and steal your speaking time. However, once I made a mistake with Henry Kissinger, I, in, I got his CV like that, you know, and then I said, took a chance and said, well, everybody know Dr. Kissinger, so I uh, don't need to introduce you. And then Henry stood up and said, well, it may be that everyone knows me, but that doesn't mean that I don't want to hear my introduction. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, my background, as some of you may know, is in big business. I used to run multinationals like ABB, the Wallenberg Group, AstraZeneca in America, GM and uh, DuPont. But 10 years ago, when I was 60, I decided to uh, phase out all my different business engagements and spend the rest of my life, my time and my money on um, uh, eradicating world's extreme poverty. I was acquainted with poverty to some extent. I've been 40 years in business, traveling in all these countries, created some 100,000 industrial jobs. In many places, you had to build houses, schools, uh, um, medical facilities. It was like, according to English, mill towns to give a decent living for the people you employed. So I'd seen with my own eyes the extreme poverty in rural areas. I'd seen the terrible living conditions in uh, um, uh, shanty towns and, uh, and such places outside the mega cities, the slums. Now, I picked India for starting because I knew India. It was sort of a second home country for me. I'd been there 50 times, a lot of employment there, new government, new business people there. And um, <clears throat> I was fascinated by the opportunity to mobilize masses of poor people into entrepreneurship, millions of them, and train them into uh, enterprise creation, uh, recruiting people, hiring people, and creating jobs. You know, we have in the world today, in aid, a sort of paradigm shift. We have reached the end of the line in the unconditional giving. Help to self-help is extremely much more effective, faster and cheaper to eradicate poverty. You can just look at history. We have <clears throat> put hundreds of billions of dollars into Africa. Still half the countries haven't started from the starting platform yet. I traveled in Western Africa a while ago and some of those countries have a lower living standard now than they had 50 years ago when they were colonists. At the same time, a billion people in Asia have lifted themselves out of poverty. Is that through aid? No. That is through entrepreneurship, hard work, savings, borrowings, integrating into the world economy. That's the way we have to go. And if you think about it, the impact on poverty is, I would say, 20 times bigger if you take $1,000 and put it into training, coaching, to make them start on their own small enterprises, hiring people, than if you give them food, clothes, shoes, or whatever. Then they get 1,000, no more. The other way, they may get 20,000. Do you want to help one? Or do you want to have 20 with the same money? Pretty easy to answer. Now, my organization, I will <coughs> touch upon a little here. We have now 650,000 women trained, and they have started 637,000 enterprises. 6,000 of them now are medium-sized, up to 50, 100 people. If you go to London and buy books in the bookstore, Chances are you get them in a jute bag uh, made by one of our women. She started with one employee, now she has 50, she's aiming for 100. That's how you lift living standard in the families and in the poor villages. 
As a matter of fact, today we start 1,000 new enterprises every working day. It is like a revolution. We have um, 50,000 people in the field, uh, 4,000 employees and 46,000 volunteers. And that keeps the cost quite low. Uh, <clears throat> just a picture here where we are active. This reliable instrument, I just push the button, then it works. <laughs> no damn technicians who run around. Here you can see this. As a matter of fact, I stopped using PowerPoint in General Motors because I felt half the time it didn't work. And technicians run around and five, ten minutes was wasted. It seems to work well in the opera, but uh, I have a bad experience. No, no more talk about that. Here are seven countries. There's India, the biggest one for us it is Brazil and a few others. Um, and we are seven more underway, Cambodia, Sri Lanka, a couple of uh, countries here around South Africa, Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Lesotho. Um, <clears throat> by the way, I used to go to the White House every year to report to President Bush how we were doing up in Afghanistan, where we have a project for two million jobs. And um, <clears throat> last time I was there, before he left the White House, he said, Percy, why the hell don't you do more in Latin America? And then I said to him, yes, we are coming. We are moving now to uh, Middle America here. Uh, Middle America, I said. Are you coming to Kansas and Missouri? <laughs> oh, that's excellent. We need jobs there, too. <laughs> you see, in English, it's Central America. <laughs> it is we who speak Swinglish, or no Norwegians or Germans, you know, who say Middle America, because that means Midwest for the Americans. <clears throat> so that's a problem when you don't really speak the language you are Swinglish speaking. The only thing that insults me is when people say to me, are you Norwegian? <laughs> because I feel the Norwegians speak even worse than I do. <laughs> they, don't, they can't even say you, they say you. <laughs> but I have to be courteous now, for God's sake, I'm in Oslo. <laughs> well, here you have the donor countries, and there you see Norway and Sweden which is not so strange with my own background. And let me take the opportunity to thank uh, the Norwegian government for the support we get here in South Africa and other places, and for a lot of people in your civil sector. Some of them are here tonight in the room. I met you, and I'd like to, to thank you for that support. Now, let me first give a few quick uh, words on the global fight against poverty. I will go rather fast now, so I have to keep your eyes on that one. Here is the world. Here you have a billion people uh, which live with, uh, under one dollar a day. To lift them up, you need 250 million jobs. The problem why you d where they are so poor is they don't have work they can live on. 50% unemployment is not unusual or even higher, and underemployment. So many jobs are required. Where will the jobs come from? Well. They won't come from the public sector. They are loans up to their eyebrows. You can't get it, uh, and I mean, uh, I, I talked to the Indian railway minister. He said to me, Mr. Barnevik, I have two and a half million people employed in the railway. I need half a million. I can't hire more people. Forget about that. Now, then you have the big companies, like those I was running. Sure, they are important. They give a pull power, but they can only give a fraction of what you need. To, to alleviate uh, the poverty. Here is where the fight is. Self-employment, micro, small, medium-sized, existing ones, growing, starting new ones. We run it through an extensive training. Some of these women can't read and write. Vocational training, we have all these entrepreneurial steps of training, and then ongoing coaching. You can see here, this is the number of women, how steep it goes. And here you have the jobs coming almost to the same level here now. Uh, you remember I said a thousand enterprises per day. We aim for 10 million jobs. 
4 million in India, 3 million in Africa, 1.5 million each in these two here. And uh, <clears throat> my calculation is as follows. In those countries where you are active, you can see what it cost per job to create them. Cheapest in southern India, where we have big scale and uh, very high efficiency. Worst in Afghanistan, not surprisingly, with the Taliban war, with uh, small villages up in the mountains, no roads, etc. So I use an average in the world of 200, which is a high number, but to be cautious. Times 250 million is 50 billion. Now, over 10 years, that's 5 billion per year. How much is that of world aid? Four, five percent. Because world aid is 120 billion. So to get that bottom billion up doesn't take that to stop all other aid work. We talk about four or five percent, not 40 percent. This is manageable. This can be done. We will do 10 billion jobs ourselves. And I know what I'm talking about. I've been into this now for 10 years. And we have a track record to look at country by country. So my big job now is to convince people like Lugrad here in Norway, who are supporting us. Norfant are supporting us. Sida Sweden are supporting us now too. I take, by the way, my Norwegian card. Because the Sida have been very slow to move. These big institutions, they like it. They are slow. So I said finally to the Swedes. Now, go beat them by the Norwegians in skiing, in the ice skating, <laughs> or go be beaten in aid also. Let it happen. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to choose your arguments. <laughs> now, um, that is the macro calculation for our aid plan for all our poverty can be eliminated. This is no blue sky mission, this is real. But it takes to mobilize and put the money in there <coughs> to get it done. Now, people ask often me, often, often uh, how is it done in reality? And these women who can't read and write, you know, what can they make, you know, where can they sell it, is it realistic? Well, let me give you very quick. Uh, you will, you will meet a group of 15 women. Unfortunately, they make the Nazi greeting, the Hitler greeting. I try to make them stop that. The culture. Then they have got more meetings. One has been in the right room. They get the bank books, they start savings, and they get some uh, such uh, microfinancing. And here you have all types of enterprises, products which are made. Services made, trade, which is done, hundreds of different types of enterprises. I give you a very quick view now, and I ask you now to sharpen your eyes because I will move fast. If you blink, you miss the picture. <laughs>
for the beauty salon. <laughs> Abandoned in that over. <laughs> These training courses get always focused and described. However poor you are, you want to look beautiful. They have the bigger enterprises, up to $10,000, brick making, biopesticide, cup making, dairies, and so on. Here they need more help and support, particularly marketing, to get into the big cities and that type of thing. Here you have, for example, the orchids, selling people, drying orchids, selling around the world. Here you have industrial bakery. Here is, what is that? That is uh, the paper the cups. They make uh, 10 million per month in Chinese machinery. And here you have hygiene things, you know, for women. And, and I'm not saying you die for this. Now, as I said to some people here I met uh, yesterday who were interested in women empowerment, you have to give women economic empowerment. Then comes social empowerment. Then comes political empowerment. Don't waste your time on traveling, speaking, seminars, books. Uh, Manifest in the UN, help the women to get a bank book, to get a job, to get some income. Then she's counted. That's what we see here. We have them. Um, I don't want to read the text. <laughs> uh, in the first two years, we got 27 bears from the castless people, the Dalits, dark skinned women who were voted mayors, and the old Brahmi men. For the end of the world that come, you know. They used to decide everything before. But the success of women to get out of the terrible life in for example India is income. From that flows the other types of empowerment. And we have people who are working against us, landowners don't like us, local landowners being wiped out uh, in replaced by our local interest uh, things, middlemen get wiped out. Uh, we become an old and angry because I don't say child labor. Sometimes the husbands become jealous because the women get now in power and get a more important position in the home. So we run gender forces for the men. Is that helps? I don't know. Uh, the women in my London office say to me that I ought to go to gender force too. <laughs> By lifting the living standard in families, all the villages, you open up for something else. When you get, when you don't, it, it is plagued by hunger, then you can think about other things. You can get children to school. We have 80 day schools and 800 evening schools and 10 people where they live. There are children, the, the worst uh, exposed ones. And they care about that. It is that I don't want them to go to school. It is just that when you have one bowl of rice per day, everyone has to work to get money and food into the house. So the way for this um, <coughs> working children to school is um, to get parents a better life. But you never give them money to replace them. Uh, they are often bonded children, so they get a thousand crowns from the weaving owner. Then the guy drinks it up, you know, the man in the house, and then they're stuck for life. Instead of paying, we uh, uh, give them a better income than parents so they can take care of their children. We have health programs for a million people picking up HIV, AIDS, uh, tuberculosis, malaria, leprosy, and other things. Then we run uh, some 2,700 citizen centers where we advise the poor people to get into society, to uh, register for voting, driver's license, and that type of thing. And then we have a <coughs> center here, uh, where uh, they are learn to handle computers, and they get service from computers. And we, aim, we have 8 million villagers now, who are included in this program, and we aim for 23 million, for 7,000 such centers. And that was also very vast. Then we have some environment projects where we dig dams and you have this 
dry landscape who becomes like that. We have 20,000 hectares under irrigation now and also work with clean water. And then we have <coughs> this um, waste people throw on the streets. Cows are eating in plastic bags, they get sick, they die, the goats and other, uh, or, or damage of rat seed, infection and other things. So we have mobilized people, a million now, to collect the garbage, sort it, recycle it, uh, uh, unorganic, in, in back to industry, pellets and that type of thing, and organic becomes <coughs> fertilizer instead of importing chem chemicals. It's very funny, I go out there from time to time to inspect them, and then I stand up like in the military, like that, you know, and say, 30 present, one sick, one absent. <laughs> with the tricycles and the bicycles. And then they do like the Americans put the arm on the park and sing the national anthem. Sort of an unusual activity for waste people. <laughs> I wouldn't think that happens in Norway or Sweden. <laughs> but they're proud of their uniforms, they're proud of what they have. Now, this gives you a very quick glimpse of how this is happening on the ground. I remember my first pictures where I talked about the global opportunity. Is this what we do now can be done on an even bigger scale? The worst poverty can be eradicated in 10 years' time. We need support, and we are happy with the support we have. The support has nothing to do with this microloans, it is for training. We could take money, get paid for training, but these people are also poor and are all like to have that speed for development that's always like a raise capital for training. This is my story. Thank you.